At some point or another, we all wonder what life is about. Why are we here? I used to plead with God, show yourself just a glimpse, then I'd know for sure. Are all of these people wrong? I have such a hard time believing that they are. You don't have to look far to see how broken our world is. Have we just become so good at pretending things like this don't happen? After you got sick, you asked me what I thought happened when someone dies. I told you what I've always believed. There is nothing else after death. Hey, good morning. Let me introduce myself to those of you who are new. My name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors at Cornerstone. And most weeks, I have the privilege of leading us in a time of studying God's Word. And that is the time that we come upon in our service now. We're going to spend some time, quality time together, saying, Hey, what's God's Word say about life? This is also the time that our two locations become one. So whether you're in Carbondale whether you're in Marion, I'm glad you're here. We have some questions to ask. We started asking those questions on 910, and really what we started was not a list of questions, but a discussion. Because each of the times we answer a question, it leads to another question. On 910, we started with the first question is being this. What is the meaning of life? Man, what a great question to ask, because if we're not careful, we just start going through the motions, and before we know it, where did life go? What am I living for? Why am I doing this? And as we asked that question, we made a discovery. None of us created ourselves. None of us chose when we were born, where we were born, to whom we were born. We were created, and our parents didn't even choose many of the things that make us who we are. We were created by God. A divine creator designed us. He's the one who gets to decide what is the meaning of our life. Just like an artist defines the meaning of a work of art. But when we answer that question of what is the meaning of life, it's defined by my creator and I'm the created, it leads to that next question. And it's this. Do I really believe in a divine creator? So the second week, last week, we came back and said, hey, does God exist? Like, do we really believe that there is a God and he has revealed himself to us in such a way that we could know him? And so as we started looking at the evidences, we discovered, hey, believing in God is nothing you will ever prove, but there is great reason to believe. Just like scientists have theories that they believe in, and it takes faith It requires faith for us to believe in God, but it requires just as much faith, and I would argue more, to not believe in God than to believe in God. And in general, we're we're kind of in big company. Uh, I told some friends, last week was kind of like I was preaching to the choir to say, there is great reason to believe in God, because somewhere around 9 out of 10 Americans would say, hey, I believe in a God. But the question of, does God exist, then leads to the next question that's a whole lot harder. And here it is. Do all religions lead to God? It's kind of like the great theological treatise Finding Nemo declared. Do all drains lead to the ocean? Isn't that an interesting question? All right, so today we're not even going to try to say, hey, who's who has the best path or the quickest path or any of that, just, just ask the question. Do all religions ultimately lead you to this God whom we now know exists? Now before you like, start giving me your answers, let me frame the question for you by saying you have four choices. Four choices. And I'm going to frame the choices from a Christian perspective, somewhere around 
almost three out of four Americans would say generally they're Christian. I mean, this is a Christian nation, they would say. So I'm going to phrase them from a Christian perspective, but no matter your religion or your non-religion, you'll be able to put yourself on the map, if you would. And I think it's appropriate for us to ask a question. We might ask the question like Facebook would give us a test. So here's the test. How narrow are you? All right, how narrow are you? Do all religions lead to God? Your Christian answer could be Jesus, period. Like, that's it. Jesus is the only way to find your way to God. Your second option would be Jesus, yes, in many. So yeah, Jesus is the way, but you can discover him in various religions. Option number three would be Jesus and many. Like, yes, Jesus is a savior, but there are, are many more as well. And then finally, Jesus, any, many, and all. You know, it's like, ah, uh, you, basically whoever wants to be in heaven can be there when it's all said and done. All right, let's, let's talk about them just a little bit deeper before you go ahead and kind of take your test, make your choice. So the first one would be exclusivism. So this is religious exclusivism where you are declaring Jesus, period. Those who do not know Jesus will not ultimately be with God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to God except through Jesus. Now there's a couple challenges with this perspective. Number one, it does not play well in America. Just talk to your friend. If you are a Christian... It's very likely that your friend will say to you, hey, I'm, I'm cool with you believing in Jesus, just don't tell me I have to believe in Jesus. Because our culture is all about choose the path that's right for you. So if you're saying there's one path, it doesn't play well with your friends or coworkers or students, and I, it just doesn't play well in our culture. Challenge number two. There is a hard question. How can a fair, righteous, holy, loving God hold the entire population responsible for a decision that some of them have never been given. Here's what I mean by that. How can God require, rightly, and hold people responsible, rightly, for a decision, trusting Jesus, and billions of people, arguably, in the world have never even heard his name? Like, how is that even fair? So, some would say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Jesus person, but I would say Jesus in many. You see, God did send his son, uh, Jesus is the way, but you can find Jesus lots of places. Let me illustrate. Let's say a missionary shows up to a tribe that's in a distant land. And no one's ever come into the village and told them about Jesus coming to be our Savior. And the missionary comes in, and he's all excited to tell people about Jesus. And as he gets to the village, the villagers begin to explain their faith. And their faith is this. We worship the buffalo who sent his son to save our village. And all of a sudden, the missionary's like, huh, is that Jesus? Can Jesus be found in places where they don't even know his name? So here's the challenge. If you'd say, yeah, Jesus in many. Here's the question. Where's the line? Like, Where's the line at which you went too far and now you can't say Jesus is in that? So for example, there are world's religions who would say Jesus was great, but we know the rest of the story. Is Jesus in that? Like Jesus plus? Like, it's great, but is, is Jesus in that one? How about, last week we talked about faith in theory. So, specifically, from a scientific perspective, some are saying, hey, I have faith in human reasoning that one day we will be able to explain the origin of the universe. We can't do it now scientifically, but I believe one day scientific theory will answer that question. Their faith is in human reasoning. Is that Jesus? 
And so some would say, okay, Jesus period, Jesus and many. Well, really it's Jesus and many. Jesus is a savior. I mean, he's, he's real to me. Like I genuinely believe in Jesus, but, but who am I to say that, that you can't find salvation in some other way? So yeah, Jesus and there's some other choices to this. One of the uh, examples used to explain this is the six blind men finding an elephant. Maybe this image will help. So here we have the guy in the back who says, huh, I think I found me a rope. And the next guy's like, no, 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 this thing ain't a rope. This is like a wall. This thing is huge. And the next guy's like, no, 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 just reach your arms around. This is this thing's a tree. It's, it's like a trunk of a tree. And the next guy's like, uh-uh, do you feel this? Wait, this thing is sharp. We found a spear. And the next guy's like, no, this thing's like a rug. I've never felt a rug like this. This is awesome. And the next guy's like, this is the biggest anaconda I've ever laid hands on. Holy smokes, it's a snake. And so people will say, hey, from a Christian perspective, it's Jesus in many. Because in your religious belief about Jesus, you have found one aspect of God. And what God is doing is he's like back here, looking at the perspective and saying, yeah, you Christians got this right, and this other religion gets this right. And, and I, you guys have all found the same thing. And I just honor that you have faith, or I honor your religiosity. Just like, it's, it's all good because I understand you're blind. And nobody can fully understand me. You're good. Jesus and many. But that one has a little bit of a problem as well. Here's the challenge to Jesus and many. What do we do with the religions that come head to head? Like they're conflicting. Because some religions would teach you that religion is becoming one with the universe. Like get connected to the divine. In some religions, that's what it's all about. Like, get connected to the divine. Other religions would say, no, it's not really get connected to the divine. It's find the divine within you. And their religion is, hey, get rid of that stuff that's keeping you from knowing who you really are. Purge that out. So religion is discovering the God within you, not connecting to the God of the universe. And other religions are like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, like, there is a divine... And religion answers the question of how do we get from here to there? Like, how do we get to God? So some would say Jesus and many. But can all these religions be right? Because they disagree. And the whole illustration of the six blind men and the elephant kind of falls apart. Because this guy says... An elephant is a rope. An elephant is not a rope. This guy says an elephant is a wall. An elephant is not a wall. An elephant is a trunk. An elephant is a spear. An elephant is, is a rug. An elephant is an anaconda. No, like all of those are wrong. None of the blind men get it right. And if you were to ask them, what did you find? Their answer would be wrong. Jesus and many kind of falls apart. So... Some would say, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I don't know. I mean, I can't even prove there's an afterlife. So in the end, it just all works out. Like, I'm thinking that in the afterlife, whatever it is, anybody who wants to be with God or the divine or whatever it is, just gets to be there. It's called universalism. So exclusive, inclusive, pluralism, universalism. What'd you choose? Because in universalism, there's also a problem. There's something in you, there's something in me. We talked about it last week, this morality. There's something God has written on our hearts where we know right from wrong. And there's something about knowing there is a creator. He has revealed himself to us, invited us to know him. But then in the end, nothing that happens here matters. Universalism. 
That doesn't make sense. Like that would be God tricking us, God playing with us. That, that doesn't make sense either. So where are you at? Where are you at? Today, I, I have the really cool privilege of, of telling you what God's word says. And let me warn you, there is a distinct possibility that what I'm about to share will feel offensive to you. There's a distinct possibility that what God's word says flies in the face of what you wish were true. And there's a very distinct possibility for about the next 20 minutes, you're just going to be pushing back and then coming forward and pushing back. You're like, no, it can't be. So I just want to warn you. I, I do not want to be offensive. I do, I'm not going to get a kick out of challenging some of the ways that many of us have been thinking. I, I simply want to share God's word with you. And I genuinely believe by the time we get done, you will find yourself saying, God is good. God is good. All right, so let's take a look. Hopefully you brought your Bible or a Bible app. We're going to throw a lot of verses up onto the screen so you don't have to have one to follow along. You can dial in to uh, our event uh, right there on our Bible app. But, but, but the, the reason I ask you to bring your Bible, bring your app, is that after we're done, you can know where to go back to and start reading again. So we're headed to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. So we're in the middle of a discussion as we've been talking about. Here's what's interesting about the discussion. The first week... We looked at one of the earliest Christian historical documents. It's the book of Acts, written by a guy named Luke. He was an intense historian. And in that first week, Luke told us the story of this guy named Paul presenting Jesus to some of the smartest people in the world. And the interesting thing about Paul is that back in the day, he thought he was doing God a service to try to stop Christians. Like he arrested them, he got them beaten. He even said they should be killed. And yet he had this amazing encounter with Jesus. God brought him to life, saved him, and now his purpose in life is telling everybody that Jesus is alive. Last week, we looked at the message that Paul wrote to the Romans. So he's never been to Rome, and he's writing to Christians about why we need a Savior. This week... We get to look again at a letter written by Paul to Titus. This is a guy he's been mentoring or doing life coaching with. Titus is a pastor in Crete, and he has a really difficult community to pastor. And Paul is writing him about what it looks like to be a faithful follower of Jesus who helps others follow Jesus. Next week, we get to hear directly from Jesus. Titus 3 and when you understand this is Paul writing to a guy he's been coaching, mentoring, a guy who's a pastor, you'll hear the heart of the message, and hopefully it won't come across as offensive as you might take it if you didn't know me or if you didn't understand the relationship that's happening between Paul and Titus. So here we go, Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to begin with. For we ourselves were once foolish. So remember, this is Paul writing another pastor saying, hey, this is, this is our uh, previous life. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating others. This is your spiritual resume. And some of you would say, yeah, that was my story. I mean, back in the day, I was a fool. Like, I did some really foolish stuff. Uh, back in my day, I was disobedient. Like, I was disobedient to my parents, to the law, to God. And I was led astray. Like, I had some friends who didn't turn out to be very good friends at all. So many of us in the room would say, yeah, yep, yep, yep. That was my day. We would own back in the day. But how about the next part of the verse? How about the part where Paul says, hey Titus, remember back then? We were like slaves. 
Slaves to passion, slaves to pleasure. You see, back in that time when you were disobedient, you were saying to your parents, hey, you ain't telling me what to do. Back in that day, you were kind of, in your mind, flipping God the bird and saying, you ain't telling me what to do either. And, and Paul says, hey, Titus, remember back in the day? We thought we were telling everybody else they couldn't tell us what to do. But the truth is, we were slaves. Like, we were living for passion and pleasure. We were living for the next high. What was your high back then? Like, what were you seeking? What did you think, man, if I had that? And you were jumping from high to high to high. From some experience, some prestige, some some purchase, some drug or alcohol. What, What was your high? Paul's saying, hey, Titus, like, we were... We thought we were in control, but we were slaves. And our lives were were really full of malice and envy. Do you you realize that about you back in the day? Malice, you want other people to fail. Why? Because it makes you feel a whole lot better about junk you're in. And you were envious. Why? Because every time somebody had something you thought you deserved, you wanted them to. To fail. You envied what they have. Malice and envy. Story of your life. And so Paul says, you know, if we really think about our lives, we can sum it up in one little phrase. Hated by others, hating others. We were hated by others because they wanted malice and envy toward us. Like when we did good, they wanted to bring us back down. Misery loves company. And we were hating them. Like we didn't love them. We were using them. We didn't want God's best for them. We wanted best for us. And we didn't care if we had to step on them to get to the high ground. Do you realize that's your spiritual resume? Like that's your story? All religions are seeking to answer the question, how do we get from here to there? Our question is, do all religions get it done? Like, here's where we are. Here's where the divine is, whatever that is. How do we cross the divide? And Paul's saying, hey, Titus, if we'll be really honest about our lives without God's help, They are worse than we would ever want to admit to anybody. Anybody. One of the beautiful truths of Christianity is that of all the religions out there, no one holds the reality of our depravity any lower than the Bible. Nobody is more honest about how jacked up we are on our own. Left to our own, we go to really dark places. And what's, what's really encouraging about that is that many of us have wondered, would God even want me? He knows more than you've ever wanted to admit just how dark your thoughts and your actions became. But, look in verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. How do we get from here to here? Of all the religions in the world, nobody talks about the mess that we're in any more honestly than the Bible. Christianity. Also, no other religion in the world holds the standard of God's divinity, purity, righteousness, any higher than Scripture. Christianity. Nobody. No religion in all the world says, hey, the gap is wide. Any wider than we do. This is the divide, and it's a chasm. There is a chasmic space between where we begin and where God is. And it is so important that we understand that as we begin to talk about how do we get from here to there. The reality is that you and your past, left to your own, 
is darker than you'd ever want to admit to anybody. And here's the little first piece of truth. That question of how can God judge people who never have a chance to respond? Let me offer one little truth. God would be just in not saving any of us. That's where we have to start. Because this is where we start. He would, he would be absolutely just to not save any of us. But, but God. But God has a plan. Verse 5. He saved us. So Paul's writing to Timothy. Excuse me, I said Timothy. Titus. That's not the end of our story. God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. 66 books in the Bible, thousands of years, 40 plus authors, three plus languages, one message. God on a mission to save his people from their sins. And in that, there is a very clear message that he came to save us because we could not save ourselves. So if you've had a view of religion that says, hey, 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 here's the divine, here is me, here are the 13 steps between he, he and me. Like if that has been your perspective, the clear message of Scripture is that you will never save yourselves. And you know it. Like you've tried, and you've tried harder, and you've got back on the wagon, and you, you know. Left to yourself, you wear out, you fall off. The overwhelming message of Scripture is, you will not be saved by your goodness. Not by your righteousness will you ever experience presence with the divine. It just won't happen. Paul continues by saying, your salvation is by God's mercy. Because of his love. Because he desires for you to be saved. Though he could rightly judge us all, he does not do that in condemning us to separation from him. He provides a way for us to be saved. And here he describes it as washing and regeneration. This washing of the Holy Spirit that brings new birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Nick, don't, don't think, hey, here are the 13 steps I need to get from me to God. Because you, you can't do it. God has to rebirth you. He has to renew you. It, it takes an entirely new life. And some of you remember when that started happening for you. For me as a small boy, I remember when the Holy Spirit began to bring me to life. I'd been in church all my life. Thank the Lord. I was raised in church, but I was just sitting there. Like I was just sitting there until God began to bring me to life. I remember what had been just wah, 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 wah. All of a sudden it clicked. It's like, oh, that's me. I thought I was good enough and discovered I wasn't. Thought I'd be okay. Realized I wasn't. God was bringing me to life. And there are many of you today that would say, that's my story. I remember when it happened. I remember the month. I remember the season. I remember the day. I remember the time that God brought me to life. He renewed, renewed you. He birthed you. And God's word says that he poured out on us richly, verse 6, through Jesus Christ our Savior. He does it by the Holy Spirit. He brought the Holy Spirit about by sending Jesus Christ. Here's the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. All religions understand the divide. 
the message of the Bible, the foundation of our faith in Jesus says the divide is bigger than you want to admit or have ever been able to conceive. The good news of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ, God came down to where we were, in the flesh, in our mess, tempted and suffering in every way that we suffer as human beings. He lived perfectly, qualified himself to die sacrificially for our sins. On the cross, he took the judgment that you and I deserve. God pouring out his wrath on his son, Jesus then overcame sin and death, victoriously being raised from the dead and inviting us to believe Him so that because of the gospel, we could trust Jesus to save us. The difference in the gospel is that God came down, took us to where we could not be, life in Christ. And when you think about it, there is nobody else claiming to be or doing what Jesus did. He claimed to be God. He lived perfectly, pulled it off. He then prophesied how he would be killed. And that's exactly what they did to him. He also predicted with great specificity the day, and how he would be raised from the dead, victorious over sin. And he pulled it off. There's great reason that God would say, I'm doing this through Jesus. Alone. He's the only one that could do this for you. Only way he's able to take you to be with me. He's it. And some of you are like, okay, 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 you know, I've, I've heard the gospel. Like, I, I believe in Jesus. Michael, I'm just, I'm just at that place. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, I do. But how can you say there's no other way? Like, I, I believe that. But is Does everybody have to believe that? How can God be just in doing that? How can God be just in holding people responsible to a belief they've never had opportunity to believe? And I would submit to you that you understand the difference between life being fair and justice being just. You already do. Let me give you an example. We all know that kid that was raised in a really dysfunctional home and he followed in the footsteps of his dad. And today, he's been convicted of and incarcerated for. And you would say, hey, what the judge declared, it was right. He should be incarcerated because that was just. And yet, you've said it. The kid had no chance. But this is just. On that day, when we stand in the presence of God, I'll make you this promise. You will say, regardless of your perspective or position on that day, God is just. God is just. And there's some parts of that we don't understand. I mean, there's, there's some parts of that, like, God, I don't understand why you didn't do it differently. And from our perspective, like, we just can't see. Like, we, okay, God, what about the village? Like, nobody's ever been to the village to tell them about Jesus. Like, what, why did you do it that way? And, and what, about the, what about the kid that has, is mentally handicapped and, and he's never going to be able to make that decision for himself? Or how, how about babies, infants, small children? Like, God, what, what about them? I'll make you this promise. On that day, no matter where you stand, no matter what position you find yourself on that day, you will say, I was right. God is just. Amen. Amen. You can trust him. He is absolutely righteous. And if we jump back over here, remember? 
if none of us made it because of who we really are, he would still be just in not saving any of us. But he is. He is. The message of God, the message of Scripture is God on a mission to save his kids. To his glory. And so that's why we continue in verse 6 and into verse 7 as we discover so that being justified by his grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I mean, we're beginning to get the whole picture. What is God doing through Jesus on this mission of saving people from their sins? Number one, he is justifying them. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, when you repent of your old ways, all your religious ways, and you trust Jesus, you are justified. You are declared not guilty, just as if you had never sinned. You are in a right standing with God. You see, here's one of the lies of religion. Religion says, um, this is like a mulligan. This is like a do-over. So our religion provides you a fresh start. You can try again. But here's what you and I both know about us. If God gives us a do-over, guess what we do over? Same thing. This is the lie of reincarnation. There's this theory that says, hey, if you have enough chances, you'll finally not be a dimwit. Problem is, we're just dim. Over and over and over again, if we had all these do-overs, we'd go right down the same path. And the good news of the gospel is, you're not given a do-over. You are declared righteous by God. Because of Jesus' righteousness. You're declared as righteous as Jesus. And so for the rest of your life, you get to figure out how to live this thing out. And not only are you not guilty, not only are you in right standing with God, you're an heir. Like you're a kid with an inheritance. I'm a child of the king. God calls me his. And all that stuff you've been chasing, all that look you've been trying to perfect, all of that persona that you so much think will bring you victory and hope and the respect of other people, you don't need any of it. By the grace of God, you're a child of the king and he loves you just as you are and he loves you too much to leave you there. He keeps growing you. It's the message of the gospel that we are justified and we are heirs according to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, there's no other religion that holds the gap wider. You know what else? There's no other religion that is any more inclusive than faith in Jesus. You're like, what? Like you're saying Jesus is the only way and Jesus being the only way is the most inclusive message in, in, in all of humanity? Yes. I'll prove it to you. Romans 10.13 says this, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Aren't you glad you didn't have to be born into the right family? I know some of your families, they're jacked up. <laughs> but aren't you glad? Mine is. Aren't you glad it wasn't based on whether or not you went too far before you turned back? Because some of us went a long way. And we wondered if we crossed that proverbial line of no return. Aren't you glad that it's not based upon how long we keep it up? Because some of us keep falling off. Aren't you glad that the most exclusive message in the world is also the most inclusive? It says everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. But maybe some of you are still going, okay, 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 okay. Like, Michael, you were right. Like, I push back, and then I come forward, and I push back, and I, something's happening in me, but I, I push back. For, 
for some of us? We've thought we've been loving our loved ones. We haven't been loving them all at all. We've been watching them die. Let me explain. Let's say that you have a friend who is dying. And she's trying all sorts of stuff, seeing all sorts of doctors, trying. But, but let's say, in this scenario, you know. You know what would heal her. Would you be loving her if you respected her in such a way that you never told her what you knew? <laughs> that wouldn't be love at all. Even if in telling her it would be offensive to her because she's been trying other things really hard. You see, you see some of us, like we, we work with people, we go to school with people, we, we have people in our homes, and we think we're being respectful of them, we think we're being loving to them to just kind of keep our beliefs to ourselves. We're watching them die. That's not loving at all. Guess what the next word in the Bible is following Romans 10, 13. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The next word is but. But. How will they know? Yes, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be saved, but how do they know to proclaim His name unless we tell them? We have friends who are going down really dark paths. And we have the solution. We have the cure. We've been entrusted with this incredible message to share. And I, 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 I don't know. I don't know why that village, and I, I don't understand why those people, I don't understand why life is so unfair that I got a much better chance at this than most people do. Like, I, I don't know why God blessed me with a, a great godly home, and I was raised and loved and pointed to Jesus, and a whole bunch of people, I mean, forget about the village, think about people in southern Illinois. There's a whole bunch of people my age that were raised, and when they were a kid, they were told the church is just full of hypocrites, and you don't need religion. That's for the weak people. And they've never had somebody who came along and said, Jesus, this is who he really is. Like, I don't know why. I don't know why I so unfairly got a head start. But I know on that day, I know on that day, when I stand before God and my sins are declared forgiven because of what Jesus did for me. And others don't experience that. We'll all say, God is good. And He's just. And He's right. And we have been entrusted with this. I don't know about the village, but I know that there are people in your life that you think you've been loving and you haven't been loving at all. God has positioned you to share the greatest message ever given. That he loves you and he loves your friend that much. We have been given an incredible joy and privilege to share the greatest message ever told. 